All right, part three of me reading this article, The Dark Side of Thomas Jefferson, page four now of the, the article at smithsonian.com, smithsonianmag.com is where I'm getting it, but it says at the top, smithsonian.com, Smithsonian Magazine, related, of course, to the Smithsonian. Uh, an interesting thing is, I've uh, got comments, um, I should be able to, um, Captain MJS, sorry, I was just thinking Captain JavaScript, and I, okay, um, pointed out an interesting link, what's interesting is, okay, I've added a link of something I saw today that I didn't talk about, um, which was a presentation of Pulitzer Prize winning author Annette Gordon-Reed, who is author of The Hemingses of Monticello. And ironically, Captain MJS has told me about a Slate article where uh, Annette Gordon-Reed actually critiques the guy that wrote the article I'm reading right now. Um, the main things are, one, she says the 4% thing isn't quite right, that he was talking about Virginia in general, and it wasn't like some inspirational insight into a turning point for Jefferson. She disagrees. And then um, she also says that the uh, stuff about there was this guy that died and left his money to free Jefferson's slaves. She says the reason that... Um, that, excuse me, Weincheck, uh, Henry Weincheck, is right, who wrote the article I'm reading, um, gave for why Jefferson didn't take that money and free his slaves and buy them land and equipment like he was supposed to, like he'd agreed with this guy, was for other legal reasons. But, you know, I really like that this woman, and you should watch her talk if you want to learn about this a little bit. She's obviously very, she's no apologist for Jefferson. She's coming from the, well, he was a slave owner, how good could it be side. But she's also very fair and level-headed, so those are interesting uh, criticisms. I will add, I, I have added already to um, the last part two a link to that article as well so we can go back and forth and as I said you know anybody debunk this and I love that this woman I found that I I respect so you know far my impression is good of her Annette Gordon-Reed um, that she's debunking the thing I mean that's all fine because what I decided was to take this seriously so let's actually talk about this Gary is he a rape apologist? Well, it'd be better to talk about him as a Thomas Jefferson apologist. That's the real issue. And what are the real issues? Well, it was multi-generational slavery. And let's talk about it like the historians and poets both, you know, uh, as if. But anyway, let's go. It was during the 1950s when historian Edwin Betts was editing one of Colonel Randolph's plantation reports for Jefferson's farm book that he confronted a taboo subject and made his fateful deletion. Randolph reported to Jefferson that the nailery was functioning very well because, quote, the small ones, quote, were being whipped. The youngsters did not take willing, 10 to 16, remember, the youngsters did not take willingly to being forced to show up in the icy midwinter hours before dawn at the master's nail forge, and so the overseer, Gabriel Lilly, was whipping them for truancy, quote, unquote. Betts decided that the image of children in 1950s, you remember, 1951, I believe, of children being beaten at Monticello had to be suppressed, omitting this document from his edition. He had an entirely different image in his head, the introduction to the book declared. Now, this is a guy that read this thing he deleted. This is kind of like why we lie to the people, why the NSA, why we have to say we don't do it and do it. Same thing that Betts thought we should delete the document that talks about beating children and say the following quote. Jefferson came close to creating, on his own plantation, the ideal rural community. Betts couldn't do anything about the original letter, but no one would see it, tucked away in the archives of the Massachusetts Historical Society. The full text did not emerge in print until 2005. That's the world you live in. In 2005. Oh, yeah, he did beat the kids, just like all the other slave owners. He thought he was a special, good slave owner. No, he's just the kind of slave owner that wants to 
be good. I'll give you a chance. If you don't dis prove you deserve to be an all very benevolent of a slave owner. I don't buy that bullshit. There's some of the worst one. That's the problem with the Democrats. It's like, I'm the nice guy that wants to fuck you over. Some people would rather be fucked over by the guy that says, I'm going to fuck you over. At least it's honest. Betts's omission was important in shaping the scholarly consensus that Jefferson managed his plantations with a lenient hand. Relying on Betts's editing, the historian Jack McLaughlin noticed that Lilly, quote, resorted to the whip during Jefferson's absence, but Jefferson put a stop to it. Slavery was an evil he had to live with, historian Merrill Peterson wrote, and he managed it with what little dosings of humanity a dialogue, a dialogical a diabolical system permitted. Peterson echoed Jefferson's complaints about the workforce, alluding to the, quote, the slackness of slave labor. They're just people that you don't pay. They're lazy. <laughs> and emphasized Jefferson's benevolence. Quote, in the management of his slaves, Jefferson encouraged diligence, but was instinctively too lenient to demand it. By all accounts, he was kind and generous master. His conviction of the injustice of the institution strengthened his sense of obligation towards its victims that he owned. I'm sorry, end quote, that he owned. Joseph Ellis observed that, quote, that only, quote, on rare occasions, and as a last resort, he ordered overseers to use the lash. Dumas Malone stated, Jefferson was kind to his servants to the point of indulgence, and within the framework of an institution he disliked, he saw that they were well provided for. His quote-unquote people were devoted to him. Just happy slaves. Happy, consenting, basically almost kind of, sort of like, who knows, you can't try, you know, you can't try a man hundreds of years later and, you know, like that bullshit. Yeah, I understand some of you think that. Fine. And you can think that. I'm just telling you. I don't think that. I vote for. Let's not think that way when we vote for how to think. As a rule, the slaves who lived at the mountaintop, including the Hemings family and the Grangers, were treated better than slaves who worked the fields farther down the mountain. But the machine, which is something that, uh, you know, Annette Gordon Reed pointed out in her talk that yeah that was definitely true the Hemings and the Grangers for example were treated special and they could see that and that might be why Sally Hemings would come back from France with this motherfucker the machine was hard to restrain however the machine was hard to restrain after the violent tenures of earlier overseers Gabriel Lilly seemed to portend a gentler reign when he arrived at Monticello in 1800 Colonel Randolph's first report was optimistic. Quote, all goes well, he wrote, and what is under Lily admirably. His second report about two weeks later was glowing. Quote, Lily goes on with great spirit and complete quiet at Monto. He is so good-tempered that he can get twice as much done without the smallest discontent as some with the hardest driving possible. In addition to placing him over the laborers in the ground, quote unquote, at Monticello, Jefferson put Lily in charge of the nailery for an extra fee of ten dollars a year. A lot of this stuff is from the records, right? The accounting. So they have little facts like that. Ten pounds a year, sorry. Once Lily established himself. His good temper evidently evaporated because Jefferson began to worry about what Lily would do to the nailers, the promising adolescents whom Jefferson managed personally, intending to move them up the plantation ladder. He wrote to Randolph, quote, I forgot to ask the favor of you to speak to Lily as to the treatment of the nailers. It would destroy their value in my estimation to degrade them in their own eyes by the whip. This, therefore, must not be resorted to but in extremities, but in extremities, but in extremities. If they don't consent, beat them. If they don't consent, then beat them. Don't beat the ones that you can make consent. Don't beat the ones that you can mind fuck. As they will again be under my government, I would choose they should retain the stimulus of character, end quote. But in the same letter, he emphasized that output must be maintained. Output must be maintained. 
I'm an American now, but must be maintained. I'm a wealth creator. Quote, I hope Lily keeps the small nailers engaged so as to supply our customers. End quote. I hope Lily keeps the small nailers, 10-year-olds engaged, engaged. Don't whip them too much, but on the other hand, keep them engaged. You know, what I mean, let's face it, engagement is the final point. Colonel Randolph immediately dispatched a reassuring but carefully worded reply. Everything goes well at Monto. The nailers all at work executing well some heavy orders. I had given a charge of lenity respecting all. Burwell absolutely accepted from the whip altogether. Before you wrote, none have incurred it but for the small ones for truancy. We put an end to all the beatings, all the unnecessary beatings. All, the only kids we're whipping now are the 10-year-olds that are late for nail shop. He's a great man. We should not call him a whipper. Perhaps those children understood that to become a hard worker, you need to be whipped. We don't know. We, we don't have a trial that can go back in time. We have no time machine. <laughs> To the news that the small ones were being whipped and that quote unquote lenity had been had an elastic meaning, Jefferson Jefferson had no response. The small ones had to be kept engaged. It's oh, there we go, that's time. Okay, stop right there. Close to the end of page lovely five. <laughs>